All right, so without any questions from yesterday, now we're going to go on to the cytology of benign and malignant breast lesions. Uh, you have your objectives on the first page of your handout there. I'm not going to, to read through those, but basically we're going to be focusing on um, the cytologic features of any breast lesion, whether it's by FNA, touch prep, um, although we're going to be focusing on FNA, you have to be aware that as I mentioned yesterday, we don't do very many breast FNAs, but you still see, you still have to be familiar with the cytologic features because either as it appears as metastatic lesions or um, as touch preps of core biopsies, so just like everything else. But a little bit about FNA first, since this is your, kind of your first introduction to some of the FNA procedures. And the pictures here focus on breast lesions, but actually some of the information applies to uh, anything that's uh, you get an FNA uh, uh, or are seen from an FNA sample specimen. Now, um, FNAs can be done either with um, just by palpation; those are superficial FNAs, or they can be done by um, image guidance. This one is kind of showing you those that you can feel and actually feel enough so that you can put a needle into the lesion. But nowadays, a lot of these are being done by image-guided ultrasound guidance to be able to locate the smaller lesions that aren't palpable. Uh, again, what we see here is a solid mass, a cystic mass. Sometimes in breast lesions, uh, cysts are aspirated and, and it's therapeutic uh, because just having a distended cyst, a large distended cyst in the breast can be quite tender, uncomfortable, and just aspirating the fluid will provide immediate relief for the patient. Uh, if the cyst fluid is clear, serous, it's not very cloudy, or it's not bloody at all, sometimes those who do the FNAs of these and collect the fluid may just discard it because most of the time the fluid is of, um, is usually benign, okay, We're very rarely malignant when it's, it has that kind of appearance. I don't personally recommend that. Okay, I like, if I collect something, I want to put it on a slide, okay? And not, but some surgeons, if they know it's a, if it's a patient with a history of fibrocystic disease, they've had cysts before, the fluid they get back is clear, not cloudy, not bloody, they're not going to be too concerned about it because rarely, rarely, rarely are those ever of concern. Now, if the fluid comes back cloudy, bloody, that's another situation. Then you get a little bit more worried and certainly uh, you want to make sure to evaluate that cyst fluid. Um, the uh, solid lumps are always, um, you know, evaluated under the microscope. So you want to make sure you get adequate material from there to assess. Uh, again, this applies to aspiration of all palpable masses. You put it, basically, you have your needle and syringe set up. You put the needle into the lesion through the skin while holding the lesion in place. Because sometimes these things move around, especially movable masses in the breast. Uh, which usually is a good benign finding, actually, on clinical exam. Um, you uh, you want to hold the lesion with one hand, usually your non-dominant hand, and use your other hand, your dominant hand, to hold the needle and syringe. And I always have a little bit of suction in the uh, syringe before I put the needle in because I'm actually going to use that suction to help expel the cellular material onto the slide. It gives a little pressure to that. Now, we do redirect the needle a little bit once we're in the lesion, but not very much. You don't want to redirect so much that you cause so much trauma and there's a lot of blood and, and so forth. Um, you know, our goal is not to have too much blood because the minute you get blood into the hub of that needle, it really makes it hard to get the cells onto the, that you want to see onto the slide. So before actually taking the needle from the lesion, from the skin, you want to make sure to release the negative pressure. Now, obviously, these are steps that only a pathologist does right now, or a physician who is uh, trained in doing FNA uh, procedures. That includes your surgeons, your ENT docs, um, your radiologists, et cetera. So you are not going to, right now, <laughs> as cytotex, and this may change in 10 years from now, who knows, you are not authorized to do FNAs. You are there to help as part of the team in preparing the slides, getting the needle and the syringe ready, because, you know, the pathologist or the surgeon may say, okay, I'm ready, hand me the needle, you know, hand me the syringe. So you're going to be there to set everything up and basically do everything uh, except for putting the needle into the lesion. You actually have to be credentialed to do that. And, and then, of course, when you um, 
it's as far as getting the material under the slide and then when the surgeon's done or the pathologist is done with it they'll hand you the syringe and say okay let's look at some slides and so then it's going to be your responsibility in most cases to get the material onto the slide okay so you have to realize that uh, one thing you do want to try to avoid is detaching the needles and then refilling it with air I mean, sometimes it's necessary but this is why I usually put a little air into this syringe beforehand because that, then I avoid that step of having to detach the needle and putting it back on um, because, you know, less needle stick injuries that way. Okay, the less you have to handle the needle, the better. So basically you get handled the syringe with the needle and you're going to expel the material onto the middle portion of the, the slide here and then stain with your rapid stain, usually your diff quick at the, at, the, uh, at the procedure site. Now, you're going to actually have a whole lecture at the end of the, um, towards the end here of your lecture box for non-gens on the FNA um, procedures. And actually, you're going to get a chance to practice doing so and making the slides. So that'll be coming up probably in April time frame. So just a little introduction there, because this is how we do breast FNAs of palpable lesions. Now, again, these same procedures apply to the non-palpable ones, except with those, you're actually using some kind of imager to help guide, usually an ultrasound, to help guide the needle. Now, what are the indications for FNA? Well, evaluation of any palpable breast mass. Same thing I could say also evaluation of non-palpable breast mass, as long as you have it and have image guidance. Um, you, it'll help distinguish between inflammatory and neoplastic processes, between benign and malignant lesions. Uh, it can be therapeutic with evacuation of breast cysts that are clinically benign. It may identify atypical lesions that may require further assessment before uh, more definitive um, treatment that's necessary. It can facilitate pre-surgical or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Neoadjuvant refers to chemotherapy that's given to patients before they undergo uh, surgery. In other words, they want to shrink the tumor down before they undergo a more radical surgical procedure, if that's indeed one of the planned steps. And it can also confirm metastatic or recurrent disease in patients who have a known history of breast cancer. Some patients, I've done a number of breast FNAs on chest wall masses on patients who, or lumpectomy scar masses that develop years after a patient has had a lumpectomy or a mastectomy and they develop nodules along their scar, that's usually a good sign of a local recurrence of the breast cancer. And one of the best ways to confirm that is by putting a needle in one of those nodules. So. Or doing FNAs of the axillary lymph nodes. Sometimes what we get, they'll actually, sometimes surgeons in their planning of surgical procedures for patients, you know, whether or not they need an axillary node dissection or not, um, after they've, um, um, th this handout you're getting here is actually one, uh, one of the guides that was put together, thank you Dave, um, a few, several, actually quite a few years ago, but it's still the only one out there. It's kind of like the Bethesda system for psychology, you know, like they have for thyroid and for, for cervical site. You haven't heard about the thyroid one yet, but it's coming, okay? But this is kind of like a nice system that kind of goes through um, the consensus for doing, uh, doing breast FNAs and recording them. And it goes through all the diagnostic terminology. It's really the best article out there. Um, for this. So uh, some of what is in this lecture today um, applies to this handout. The, um, well, oh yes, for um, patients with possible axillary node involvement, sometimes the surgeons will already have a diagnosis. They'll get the patient who's been referred to them from radiology with a positive core biopsy that they did by stereotactic means. And so the next step is they refer them to the surgeon for a definitive treatment. And so if they palpate something in the axilla and they're suspicious about it, you know, palpate a mass that might be a, a positive node, um, they'll ask, sometimes they'll ask us to come up and do an FNA of the lymph node. Because if it's positive, then that saves them the whole step of having to do the sentinel node thing. Then they just do the complete axillary node dissection. But most of the time, lymph nodes are not palpable. It's because they're small. Um, when they're palpable, it means they're they've gotten quite big and are most likely positive. 
So, but again, this will help confirm them and save them another step in the OR, and they can plan ahead of time. Yes, well, I'm going to do a lumpectomy and an axillary node dissection, and that really helps cut down on any possible repeat OR time for the patient. You know, it really helps in the overall management. Now, breast FNA is is. You know, despite the fact that it's not used as much anymore, it has a very high accuracy rate of about average of 90%. Uh, sensitivity varies between um, wide range between 72 and 99%, but overall mostly it's 90% or greater. Specificity is very low because think about it. What does specificity? Um, what does it um, mean? It means you know a lesion that is. Or, or a, a test that is very specific has a very low false positive rate. So it reflects the, fa the false positive rate, basically. And you want to make sure you have a very low false positive rate in breast FNAs because think about it. Surgeons might, you know, if you call something malignant, they may, that patient could potentially get a mastectomy. So you don't want to overcall a malignancy when it's not, and then the patient ends up getting a mastectomy. That would be a very bad thing. That's like a lot, an, an automatic lawsuit, okay? Now, the, now, sensitivity, so it's very highly specific. I mean, it's very rarely that lesions are called malignant on cytology, and they're not, okay? Now, in contrast to that, sensitivity re, um, represents the false negative rate. Uh, so there is a higher false negative rate. It's usually about, it's around 5 to 10%. This is a wide range from a number of studies over a number of years, but nowadays the false negative rate varies on average between 5 to 10 percent for breast FNAs. And um, that means that there are just some lesions. You know, what does a false negative mean? It means that you call it benign when it's really malignant, okay, basically. Um, there are certain lesions that tend to increase the risk of having a false negative uh, report, and we'll talk about that later. But you know, that's more common than the false positive, but usually it doesn't, you know, usually what happens in these settings if the cytology is negative and the clinical findings and the radio radiologic findings look suspicious, the patient is still going to have a, the appropriate follow-up uh, based on the other parameters. So it doesn't, it's not as necess, not doesn't necessarily mean as bad outcome for the patient as a false positive could be. All right, so in general, breast FNAs are very, I like to use the acronym SAFE. SAFE stands for simple, accurate, fast, uh, economic, efficient. It's also, you know, potentially therapeutic, relieving, you know, cysts, fluid from um, in painful cystic breast lesions. It can provide relief for the patient's anxiety. It can also increase the patient's anxiety, but in some it provides a, some, some comfort. Um, and it can be used for evaluation of both palpable and non-palpable lesions. And of course, in that setting, as I mentioned, you want to use some kind of image-guided means to help uh, obtain the sample. Now, what are some of the reasons for a false negative result? Well, small lesions and large lesions, believe it or not, because some of the larger, smaller lesions are sometimes hard to get, um, both by image guidance and palpation. The larger lesions, sometimes you don't know if you're going to get a, a good sample from the most appropriate area of the lesion. And sometimes when they get so large, they get necrotic in the center, and then you get, take the risk of getting a lot of necrotic debris back instead of cells, you know, that are going to help you in the diagnosis. Of course, uh, lesions that are deeper in the upper quadrants of the breast are, some, are hard to sample. Um, if it's very fibrotic, very desmoplastic, sometimes it won't give up its cells, so it's hard to get cells from. If there's a lot of cystic change and all you get is a background of cystic fluid instead of diagnostic cells, and if there's a lot of necrosis. And of course, it depends on the tumor's degree of differentiation. If it's a very well differentiated uh, carcinoma, it can be very difficult to separate out from some benign and atypical lesions. Um, poorly differentiated, that's usually not um, as, as much of a problem. Slide preparation is always important and experience. Um, in doing the FNAs is very important. Those who don't have good experience um, may not get a good sample. Those who don't interpret a lot of FNA specimens may overcall or undercall certain lesions. It really does require experience. Uh, what, and some of, some of the same reasons for false positive diagnosis include, in, in, include experience, 
uh, in doing the FNA as well as interpreting the materials. You don't want to over interpret a typical and proliferative lesions. But in the breast, if you think there's atypia there, it's always better to call the atypia so that they can at least get a follow up biopsy. You know, because if you call a, a breast FNA um, sample atypical, and you're not going to learn today how to interpret atypical lesions, because, you know, that's kind of like ascus in, the, in a way. But you have to realize that when you start actually looking at them in your, in your laboratories, you, you may use the word atypia in a number of settings. Okay. So you have to realize that there are some atypia. You're not going to be tested on it, atypia, in other words. In other words. But the, um, it is important to recognize that there is this gray zone, just like everything else in cytology of some atypical lesions. That, and it's OK to use that word in this setting um, to make sure the patient gets the appropriate follow-up. You don't want to overuse it, of course, but it's, you know, there, are, there is use for it, that word. You have to know your limits. <clears throat> know what your surgeon's going to do with a positive FNA result. That's really key. Now, at BAMC, the surgeons know that we're, we have several cytopathologists in the department, and we all, if we call it malignant, they're, they're very comfortable with that dying, very confident of our, I shouldn't say comfortable, very confident as we are with our positive diagnosis. And that patient may get defended, will get definitive treatment, which can include a mastectomy from just an FNA result that's malignant. Um, I'm good with that, but I have to feel confident in my positive diagnosis before I call it outright malignant because I know what could be the potential outcome. Same thing with negative. Negative, if I call something benign in the breast, it, I, I still have to make sure I have a good sample that explains a lesion that they were trying to go after. If it doesn't explain a lesion that's clinically and radiographically suspicious, um, I'm not sure I can call it adequate or negative. You know what I mean? You really have to know what is going on. You have to know, as we'll talk about later on, what the physical exam and the mammographic findings show. Why are they concerned about this lesion? Because it really makes a difference in the overall diagnosis. And always communicate your, you know, with the physicians. Now, this article highlights this, but you know, this has been kind of a controversy amongst a number of FNA specimens, not just the breasts. You know, how do you determine a specimen is adequate? You know, do you count the cells or not? Well, there's kind of two approaches to this. You have your counters and you have your non-counters. Um, in general, and we follow this rule at BAMC as well, um, pretty much, you want to see at least six groups of well-preserved ductal epithelial cells present on the smear. That's not very many. And remember, you know, your normal breast FNA isn't going to be very cellular, you know, but you still want to see, you want to see ductal cells that is what, you know, the cell you want to see to be able to call it adequate. Now, some, now the noun counters say, well, specimen is considered adequate if it answers a clinical question or explains a lesion. What if this is cystic lesion and all you get back is cyst fluid and you don't have, you know, you have maybe one or two groups of epithelial cells? Well, in that setting, you can kind of word it such that, um, yeah, it's, Posse cellular, but because it does look like a cyst on clinical exam, on radiologic exam, then it's probably, you know, adequate because it has enough uh, to explain the fact that it's a cyst. And that way you call it a cyst with, with that comment. Yes. So you say no, five to six groups is the usual. I don't. It, it really depends. It's going to be depending on the pathologist. If I'm comfortable as a cyst and all I got is cyst fluid material, which is macrophages and cellular debris, and, and I know that um, everything else on it cause, says that it's cystic um, based on clinical exam. And is it, in that setting, I need to know what the clinical exam and the mammogram shows, if they've had one done, or an ultrasound. And, and if it all points to a cyst, then I'm comfortable with calling it negative but only in that setting. Now, the, again, right in here is where you have your NCI recommendations. And they actually, what they recommend is giving a description of the, the cellular component. You know, if, if there's few, moderate, or abundant epithelial cells present, um, you know, that's, that's OK, too. That at least tells the um, 
providers and that you know what's going on it, usually when you you know the normal or benign breast fna is going to have very few cells uh, when you start seeing abundant cells, there's two things to think of right away when you have abundant epithelial cells. Two things in the differential, thyroidinoma and cancer, okay? Those are the two lesions in the breast, as you'll learn about this morning, that are going to give you a lot of cellularity, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, now, uh, it's important to always monitor your unsatisfactory or inadequate specimen rate at it really is somewhat dependent um, on the provider who's doing the FNAs, experience with doing FNAs. And generally, we like to keep that percentage less than 20%. We actually try to keep it below 10%, but um, that's the recommendation in the, in the article here. All right, so that's just some background. Now let's look at some of the general cytologic features before we go on and some of the normal cellular morphology before we go on to specific um, features of the lesions. Now, in general, like any FNA, this actually applies to any FNA with the exception of myoepithelial cells. Okay, this is what you're going to be looking at. You want to assess the, on the slide, the overall cellularity, you know, is there, are there few moderate or abundant epithelial cells present? What are the cellular arrangements? Are they, are there acinar elements? Are there tubules? Are there sheets? Are there syncytia with overlapping cells? So all of those arrangements are important to note. Are there single cells only? That's important. Now, in the breast FNA, you always want to note, are there myoepithelial cells present? Because their presence generally indicates a benign process. Okay? Their absence is concerning for something malignant, potentially. Are there intact single epithelial cells present? That's also a worrisome feature in breast FNAs because, as you'll see in a moment, most benign breast FNAs are going to have sheets of epithelial cells that are where the sheets are intact and very little, if any, single cells with retained cytoplasm. Okay, so if you see any intact epithelial, and that's what it means, intact meaning the cell has nucleus and cytoplasm. So if you see any intact epithelial cells that are single on a breast FNA, that kind of raises a red flag as well. Look at the cellular atypia. Is there any atypia as in an isonucleosis or pleomorphism? Are there nucleoli? Is there chromatin clumping that's irregular? What other cells are present besides epithelial cells? What does the background look like? Is it clean? Is it dirty? Um, does it have mucin, for instance? like we saw yesterday with colloid carcinoma. So the normal breast cytology is usually, as I mentioned, very scantily cellular. It will have rare to few small honeycomb sheets of cohesive ductal epithelial cells. And you want to see at least five to six groups, okay, to call it adequate. If you're dealing with a, like a, if you have a solid nodule that you know is being aspirated, and you, you don't have five or six groups, then you're probably going to call it inadequate. But he, what you're looking for are these honeycomb sheets of cohesive ductal epithelial cells. They have a small uniform size, uh, measuring 6 to 10 micron in diameter, um, round to oval nuclei with smooth nuclear membranes, vesicular chromatin, and inconspicuous nucleoli. This is like any glandular cell you've seen elsewhere, right? Okay. All right. But the other thing you're going to see is myoepithelial cells. And myoepithelial cells will show up as stripped nuclei in the background. They're actually, very rarely do they show cytoplasm. So they show up as these naked nuclei that have a bipolar appearance, meaning they, they're oval with this kind of um, ends of the nuclei that look regular. Like if you were to split the nucleus in half, one side would look like the other. That's what, you know, refers to bipolar. Basically, they're oval-shaped nuclei with they have a uniform appearance. Um, and there can be few of them. There can be many of them. Now, also in the breast, what else can you see besides uh, breast parenchymal elements? You see your background fat and stromal tissue because there's, a, you know, abundant fat and stromal tissue that also surrounds the breast parenchyma. So here's your classic example of a flat honeycomb sheet of benign appearing ductal epithelial cells. Very cohesive, 
Notice that the nuclei are very uniformly placed, as you see in a lot of normal glandular cells. The nuclei are very uniform with a round to oval appearance, um, very uniform chromatin distribution, and indistinct nucleoli uh, that you can see in some of these cells. So very um, classic appearance. These are very nice for benign, normal ductal epithelial cells. Here's some more, little lower power, where you see a nice cohesive sheet here. You don't see any single intact cells. You do see some, a few neutrophils in the background and a few blood cells, but that's it. Maybe a little wisp of fiber connective stroma here, but that's it. Maybe you get a little lumen here, which you'll sometimes see, but that's normal. What other cells, the myoeps, are very important to recognize in breast FNA? They are small oval cells with hyperchromatic nuclei. They're smaller, they're slightly smaller than usually than your ductal cells with what we call kind of a football shape, okay, because of their oval, oval appearance. They often occur as single nu naked nuclei in the background, meaning they don't have any cytoplasm. Or, or they can also be associated with the ductal epithelial groups. But you see them as you focus out of the, the group, you have to focus out of the ductal group a little bit, and they kind of overlie the group. You'll see that in just a moment, and you'll see that on the slides too. Foam cells are basically macro, macrophages that are multivaculated. In the breast, they're called foam cells, but all they are are foamy macrophages, okay? So when you hear the term foam cells, that's all it's referring to. And foam cells are common in both in normal breasts as well as and especially common in fibrocystic change because what happens when you get cysts? You get macrophages, right? All right, so let's look at some examples. Now here, the pink, this is a diff quick, and the, on diff quick, the, the stroma tends to stain metachromatic, so that's why it looks kind of pinkish, purplish here. Um, and all of these cells here are myeloepithelial cells. You notice how they're all single, they're, they're devoid of cytoplasm, and they have an oval shape to them. Fairly uniform in appearance and very bland. Um, there are some that are actually embedded within the stroma as well, although some of the more elongated ones in the stroma are, are probably just some fibroblasts. Here's some more isolated myoepithelial cells on a breast FNA. You've got all of these cells. See them all here? Kind of football shaped, single cells with no cytoplasm. All you see are nuclei. Now, if this is all you saw on a breast FNA and you didn't see any ductal epithelial cells, would that be adequate? But you're right. That's right. You, I, the, you know, you could have myoeps present, and if you don't have any ductal epithelial cells present, I don't feel that, you know, that's an adequate sample of a solid lesion, okay? Here's another example. Now this is on PATH, and you see there's quite a few of them, quite a few. Now there's some other cells here in the background, but most of these cells that are the smaller ones that are hyperchromatic, uh, I think there's actually a few ductal epithelial cells here that are a little bit larger, but most of these are myoepithelial cells, hyperchromatic, um, devoid of cytoplasm, mostly single, uh, and, and again, when I see this, it kind of tells me that we're in, the, in conjunction with a benign appearing epithelial component, it tells me that we're probably dealing with something benign. Here's some more on diff quick. You're going to see this, these a lot, and you're really going to want to be able to recognize them um, on, the, on slides because it's going to be very helpful. And here's some more. Now, this is what I meant, how sometimes, you know, yes, most of the time they'll show up as single cells in the background, but the epithelial component that's also present, you can also see them, but you have to look closely. Look at here's one plane, here's another plane of the same group. So it's the same group, just taken at different uh, planes of focus. And if you look at this one here, again, this is, these are all ductal epithelial cells here. But if you look closer, do you see the darker cells in here, here, and here, that are a little, that are more hyperchromatic and a little bit more oval, a little bit more football shaped, so to speak? Those are myoeps. The other ones with the more open chromatin and slightly larger, and with nucleoli, are your ductal epithelial cells. So you can actually make up myoeps even in this plane. But they're better seen here 
because this is now where the ductal cells are out of the plane of focus, and now you can actually see better the myoepithelial cells. See how they stand out? And you'll, you'll see that when you look at the microscope. All right, foam cells we talked about. These are basically foamy macrophages filled with, you know, multivaculated macrophages that are not uncommon in a breast stephanies, especially in those with cystic change, uh, obviously. Uh, and again, they're just typical foamy macrophages that you've seen in other sites, and they're, we refer to them in the breast as foam cells. Now, what about some other cellular elements to be aware of? The um, uh, apocrine metaplastic cells, we talked about that yesterday. They tend to occur in the set in what um, setting, what disorder, what lesion will show lots of apocrine metaplastic cells? We haven't gone to that yet, but I talked a little bit about it yesterday. Most commonly seen in... Yes, exact fibrocystic change. That's right. So if you see a lot of African metaplastic cells, you know that have this, the lining cells of the cysts in that setting um, like to undergo metaplasia. And they met when ductal cells undergo metaplasia, and it's again in response to, you know, inflammation and cystic change. Um, they they form what's called apocrine metaplastic cells. Uh, the apocrine metaplastic cells are basically you know, a form of ductal epithelial cell. They just undergone this transformation. And they uh, show up as three-dimensional clusters. And sometimes in this setting, sometimes you will see single cells, uh, round cells with abundant granular and dense cytoplasm that looks eosinophilic some, or blue on PAP or blue-purple or gray on dipquick. Uh, they tend to have a round, uh, slightly eccentric nucleus and a prominent nucleolus. They look similar to oncocytes. Have you seen oncocytes yet in other things? Um, maybe in the, in the pancreas or, yeah. Um, but again, oncocytes are, and, and what do oncocytes have? Abundant mitochondria, right? That's what gives them that granular appearance. And again, why do they get this? Well, it's a response to the inflammation, the cystic change, etc. Now, there's other cells also that you'll see on breast stephanies, uh, fat cells or adipocytes. Inflammatory cells are usually few, but there will be some. Um, stromal cells, including fibroblasts, that may or may not be embedded within the um, fiber connective stroma. All right, so classic African metaplastic cells on pap stain. You notice how these cells have much more abundant cytoplasm than ductal epithelial cells that looks very granular kind of has a polygonal shape to them. Almost looks like hepatocytes, don't they? <laughs> okay, they do, don't they? I mean, um, but they're not, okay. Uh, in fact, they're not, probably the cytoplasm isn't as dense as you might see with hepatocytes, but they definitely have that look. Um, uh, some are binucleated, that's not uncommon. The nuclei are larger than normal ductal epithelial cell nuclei, and they usually have prominent nucleoli, as you see here. Now, you notice how the cytoplasm here looks both blue and kind of pinkish red. Now, again, I think, you know, most of the time in a well-stained, well-prepared preparation, um, the cells are going to look blue uh, like this. I think part of the reason why they look a little tinged here to the pink is probably because of the stain didn't penetrate the cell completely. Now, here's another example, both on DIFQUIC and PAP stain. Now, here... Right here, these cells here with the more abundant cytoplasm are your African metaplastic cells. Um, you notice how the cytoplasm looks dense and somewhat granular, and there's some binucleation. Here's some more up here, although the cytoplasm here is a little paler, but they're still the same cells. These are your normal ductal epithelial cells right here. You notice this nice cohesive group of very uniform appearing cells. You can't see the chromatin as well here, but that's because these... Um, Nuclei have undergone some degeneration, and, and what happens when nuclei get degenerated? They get dark, right? But again, they're uniform, they're small, they're, the group's cohesive, and then in the setting of these apocrine cells, you know, this is a good indication of fibrocystic change, actually. Same thing over here, for contrast. These are ductal epithelial cells. These are um, apocrine metaplastic cells. Again, they look a little looser, but it's because they have more abundant cytoplasm. The nuclei are slightly larger. 
And, and here are your, again, both nice cohesive group of benign appearing ductal cells. Other cells to see, fat cells. These are normal adipocytes, uh, mostly composed of a large uh, amount of fatty material with the nucleus compressed to the outer rim. And some of them, you can't even see the nucleus. Again, I, if I see that, and if that's all I have on my FNA smear, that is not an adequate specimen. <laughs> all right, this doesn't count towards adequacy. But, you know, you, you will see them, and you got to get used to seeing it. Fiber connective tissue. Here's a, a large fragment, stromal fragment, with some fibroblasts embedded within it. It's not usually this cellular, but you know you have to be aware of that appearance. And then, of course, a group of ductal cells over here. And some myoeps in the background, by the way. <laughs> All right, so those are the general cytologic features of the cellular components that you expect to see in breast FNA cytology. And with that background, now we can actually look at the individual lesions and look at what makes up, in the, you know, the appearance of some of the lesions that we talked about yesterday. Again, beginning with the benign uh, non-neoplastic conditions. Now, with acute mastitis, uh, again, this is a list of things we're going to look at. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to go ahead and show you the examples. All right, so we looked at this yesterday, acute mastitis. What is it going to show? Right, abundant acute inflammatory cells, abundant background necrotic debris. Um, uh, sometimes you'll see some capillaries because of the increased vascularity. And again, you know, most common uh, causative organism is staph. Strep can also do this. And you might want to consider in this uh, setting is to get a sample for culture. And that, that can be potentially helpful. All right, now this is an interesting one. This is actually from a subareolar abscess. Now, what are these cells here? What do they look like? They're a, kind of a nucleus in appearance. There's a nucleus squames, exactly. Now, that's a very important clue to this lesion because, you know, usually these abscesses occur right beneath the areola, you know, therefore its name. Um, it, it will show a mixed inflammation in the background as well as abundant neutrophils. But in addition, it characteristically shows these anucleate squames because remember, the areola is covered with stratified squamous epithelium. And this is a clue to this lesion. You don't see this in the other types of abscesses. And if you have this, you got to think about this possibility because this type of abscess may need surgical debridement. And it may not respond entirely to antibiotics and may need surgical debridement. So it's important to mention that. All right, here's another example on DIFQIC. You've got to recognize squames on DIFQIC too, right? Sometimes it's a little harder, isn't it? All right, well, you've got your abundant uh, inflammation in the background here, both acute and chronic, some macrophages. And then you've got these cells here with this kind of dense blue cytoplasm, which actually represents some squames. Now, the squames here in this setting can also look a little bit atypical because of the inflammation. All right, what about fat necrosis? Again, uh, usually associated with history of trauma. Uh, clinically, it can resemble a cancer, so you have to make sure that, you know, these need to be sampled to make sure you're not missing a cancer. But again, you're going to look for fat cells that have undergone degeneration as well as foamy macrophages and some mixed inflammatory cells in the background. And I have to tell you, it can be hard to distinguish the fat cells from the foamy macrophages because they look very similar when the fat cells undergo degeneration. But that's OK. When you get this kind of appearance, uh, along with all this inflammation in the appropriate clinical setting, you can suspect this um, fat necrosis. Now, we talked about silicone mastitis yesterday, and usually it's a granulomatous uh, type of inflammation and occurs in the setting of ruptured silicone breast implants. You look for the um, multinucleated giant cells. You see a couple of them here that may have engulfed uh, globules of this um, refractile, non-polarizable foreign material. You can just barely make it out here. Do you see within this globule here, there's some kind of material? It looks like it. It's very clear, non-polarizable. So it's important to try and make that out. That actually represents the uh, silicone material. And the histiocytes are very commonly vacuolated as well.
history is important there. And, you know, I've seen patients with silicone mastitis also develop breast cancer. Um, and so you have to always make sure not to miss that as well. All right, what about lactational changes? Remember the lactational ductules we saw in uh, lobules that we saw yesterday and how active they looked? You know, the cells are large. They have abundant vacuolated cytoplasm. Um, they, they have enlarged nuclei. So you can, that's exactly what we're going to see on, on cytology. Uh, first of all, they tend to be very, they tend to be very cellular. Um, so that's another lesion that can also be quite cellular on breast FNA. Uh, the groups of cells tend to be, uh, show some discohesion. So you may actually see some loose groups and single cells with intact cytoplasm. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're malignant. They're most likely benign. They get loose because of all the, um, the abundant, uh, fragile cytoplasm. So we see some examples here. You see some uh, very crowded groups here. Uh, and then you see some loose groups as well as occasional single cells with intact cytoplasm. The other key is look at the background. You notice how the background looks bubbly? Okay, very bubbly appearance to the background. And that's actually um, the secretory material. You know, remember these cells are highly secretory. They're making a lot of material for the milk basically, and so that's what you're going to see in the background. So if you see those kind of cells in this background, that's a really good clue that you're dealing with lactational change, because you don't see that in generally in normal breast FNA. Uh, the, uh, notice that the cells, the individual cells, have abundant pale cytoplasm with lots of tiny vacuoles and large vacuoles as well throughout, um, and that's very typical of lactational change. Now, you do look, you're still going to see myoepithelial cells in the background. You can actually see a few here and there, the darker ones that are smaller. And that's a good feature to help support um, uh, benignancy again. Again, this is always, because of the looseness to these groups, this can be a potential pitfall for breast cancer. But in this setting, a breast cancer isn't going to show really this much it's going to have much more cellular anaplasia, many more individual cells, um, and very high MC ratio, not this amount of cytoplasm usually. All right, some more examples of lactational change. This is on path stain. Again, you see how granular the background looks? It has that very granular look. That's because of all that secretory material. Notice that this group is, is still re retaining some cohesiveness, but the cells have abundant vacuolated cytoplasm and enlarged nuclei, often with prominent nucleoli because these cells are very active. Higher power to show you the same thing. Uh, again, cohesive group of cells with abundant vacuolated cytoplasm and enlarged nuclei with prominent nucleoli. And then those are very characteristic features. Again, notice the background looks granular. All right, now fibrocystic changes. Well, um, again, we talked about fibrocystic changes having a whole spectrum of uh, features. Um, but these are the very characteristic ones to, to really know about, the, simple, the ones that we see in simple fib fibrocystic changes. What you look for are flat sheets, so in other words, flat sheets of intact, uniform ductal epithelial cells. Apocrine metaplasia is common. There may be a few background, in fact, well, you always expect to see some background myo Fs in a benign condition, but in, in fibrocystic changes, you may not see a whole lot, but they'll be there. Foam cells, because of the cystic component, and this background debris from the cyst fluid that gives it this kind of proteinaceous uh, appearance. So very characteristic findings. Those kind of a mix of things, you should be familiar with that. Um, and again, here's some examples classic examples from a fibrocystic change, a nice cohesive group of ductal epithelial cells, and what are these? African metaplastic cells, right? Very nice example of both. Um, the background doesn't look too granular here. You may see a few inflammatory cells. Uh, that's a mile F right there. That's a mile F right there. There's another mile F there. There's two more up here. So, And there's even some in the group here. See that? See that? So you can really make them up now. So this is all very good for, so I would, this kind of case would be called um, benign um, 
cellular features consistent with fibrocystic changes. Well, basically, I call it cellular features consistent with fibrocystic changes. Uh, no malignant cells identified. The usual benign diagnosis, right? All right. For you, you probably could just say fibrocystic change, right? Because <laughs> okay. that is one of the ones you have to know to call, right? Fibrocystic, of course. Yeah. Here's some more examples of the African metaplastic cells. Again, a group of fiber of uh, epic of African cells, and maybe a couple foamy macrophage foam cells in here. Here's some more. Okay, African metaplastic cells, foam cells. Now, foam cells generally have a little bit more paler cytoplasm to them, a uh, little bit smaller nuclei. Uh, so just be aware of that. Okay, the African cells, foam cells. Here's another example. Again, now this is a group of ductal cells, but they look very hyperchromatic, a little bit crowded. Now the crowding you can sometimes see when there's a little bit of hyperplasia going on. Okay, uh, the the hyperchromasia is probably because they're a little bit degenerated, which happens when cells get exposed to a cystic environment. They are, they undergo degeneration. So sometimes the nuclei are going to just look like that. And I think it's just important to be able to recognize their epithelial cells and that they're cohesive and don't have any other significant atypia. And then what's in the background here? What are all these cells? No. Bone cells, yeah. You notice how they look more, they have vacuoles throughout. Apocrine cells don't have vacuoles, usually, usually. They may occasionally, but not this to this degree. And and also notice the nuclei are small, very small compared to what I would expect with African cells. And also in the background, this is just all degenerated cellular material. And what that's what happens in cis fluid. You get a lot of cellular degeneration. So that's what we're seeing. Degenerated cells, other cellular debris. Degenerated ductal cells, foam cells, this is all very consistent with um, a cystic component of a fibrocystic chain. Now, I mentioned to you, we talked quite a bit yesterday about the hyperplasia that can occur in the setting of fibrocystic change. And so you'll have a whole you know, variation of hyperplasia and some atypia. The important thing is not to, is not to overcall malignancy here. And you're going to have to be able to recognize when you got to call it atypical in this setting. Now, it's not uncommon to have hyperplasia in fibrocystic change to some degree. Uh, and some of the groups, what are they going to show? They're going to show some increased cellularity, uh, some nuclear overlapping and crowding. Because remember what our flat, normal ductal epithelial cells look? There was no nuclear overlapping. In this setting, you can see some a little bit of crowding and nuclear overlapping. But at the same time, the group is going to remain intact, and you're going to see myo-Fs in the background or overlying the group. Okay, so you, you want to make sure you look for those. Although myo-Fs may be fewer in number in this setting, look for nuclear atypia. If it's if it look a, if they look atypical, call it atypical. Okay. Here's some examples. Now look at this group of ductal cells, much larger than you've seen already, right? Well, this was from a case of of a patient with. Um, proliferative breast disease in the background of fibrocystic changes. So there's some usual ductal hyperplasia going on here, and the groups can get a little larger with more numerous cells and a little bit of nuclear overlapping. But otherwise, if you look at them and you kind of focus in at the edges where it's not as overlapped, the nuclei look very uniform and consistent with benign ductal cells. And then, of course, I'm sure we can find a few myo-Fs in the background or even associated with the group. And, and this is kind of what it's showing you. This is on histology. This is what an example of florid or moderate ductal hyperplasia looks like. You've got this big sheet, uh, or ex I should say, duct that has been expanded with cells and some irregular looking lumens uh, throughout. But you see all these dark cells in here? You see all those? Those are myo-Fs. That's always a good finding, OK? And this is kind of what it would look like on cytology, again. A big group of ductal cells, a little bit of streaming, and some irregular spaces. But in addition, you can make out a few myo-Fs there. So that's always good. This would be benign. Same thing here. Notice, again, this kind of sometimes when these groups get very large, they can show this kind of cellular streaming. 
but again, it remains cohesive and intact. Same thing over here, you start to get these larger lumens that kind of vary in size and shape right within the group of cells. And that's okay, this just tells me that we have some ductal hyperplasia. And that's a benign finding. Same thing here, a little bit of nuclear overlap, um, but again, you see that there are some myo Fs both in the group as well as outside. There's a foam cell there. Um, again, these are just benign ductal cells. Now here, there's actually a little bit of atypia, and this is where, this is a kind of lesion. If I saw this, I would call it atypical. I wouldn't call it out, if this is all I had, I couldn't call it outright malignant. It's just not enough, okay? But um, you notice how this group, there's quite a bit of irregularity in shape and size to these nuclei. You notice that the chromatin is starting to show a little bit of regularity. Um, there's starting to be some prominent nucleoli that look irregular. You notice over here, there's starting to be some single cells, kind of, kind of a looseness to the group. Now, you still have myoeps. There's one there. There's one there. But, you know, the nuclear atypia and the discohesion here is bothering me. And that's what would get an atypical diagnosis, interpretation. All right, now, what about some of our neoplastic lesions that are benign? Now, what are, our most, what are the ones that we want to focus on here? Your fibroadenomas, your papillomas. Um, we'll talk about phyllodes a little bit later, and then gynecomastia. The... Um, now, you really have to be familiar with the appearance of fibroadenomas, very characteristic findings. This is going to be one of your calls. And um, these, and I mentioned this earlier, that fibroadenomas tend to be very cellular specimens, not as cellular, I mean, much more cellular than fibrocystic change, okay? They can be very cellular. Um, there can be ductal hyperplasia. So what are you going to get? These large sheets of ductal cells, all right, that are... They have a little bit of nuclear overlapping, but they remain intact. And they also get these little papillary finger-like nubbins on the surface of the ductal epithelial group. So it gives it kind of sometimes like a, a stag horn or antler horn kind of appearance, little finger-like projections from the surface. And it's all because of ductal hyperplasia that's occurring in this setting. But the other characteristic finding is the prominence of stromal fragments that can look very metachromatic, undiphoid, and the fact that there are numerous myoepithelial cells, a lot more than you see in other lesions. Um, and so these are very characteristic features of fibroadenoma. And if you have all these features present, you can call it fibroadenoma, okay? Um, now, be aware that fibroadenomas, because of their cellularity, are probably one of the most common reasons for false positive diagnosis. In other words, overcalled as malignant. Okay. And the other thing is that occasionally fibroadenomas, and this doesn't happen very often, but you may see a few uh, single intact cells, but usually not a lot. And so I don't get too concerned about it. Um, and if there's significant nuclear atypia, then I may call it atypia in the setting of a fibroadenoma. But again, that's kind of getting a you know, looking at some of the less common things that we see, but need to be aware of. All right, so classic findings. All right, very cellular specimen. You're going to find lots of epithelial groups on the given smear. These are some of them. Um, here's one on pap stain at low power. Here's a, a couple on diff quick. Uh, very large groups, okay, with these like little finger like projections. Um, some of them. Uh, we, I don't appreciate it here. Here they look more rounder, but on some of them they'll look kind of pointed and kind of look like deer antlers. You notice the background looks very clean, okay? There's no diathesis. That's important to know. Um, there are some blood cells. There's some stromal fragments over here. And usually, you can't see it yet at this power, usually numerous myelaps. All right, so here's another example. Now you've got a ductal epithelial group here. Um, another crowded one up here, and then a stromal fragment here with some embedded fibroblasts. But then what else do you see? Myoaps, right? So ductal cells, lots of myoaps, lots of stromal fragments, very good for fibroadenoma. Now here's what we mean by the antler horn branching. You can get these 
papillary um, projections from the surface of the epithelial group that almost look like deer antlers, okay? Doesn't it kind of look like that, doesn't it? Okay, and that's where it gets that. You hear that name, antler horn or stag horn branching. It's very characteristic. But again, note, the group is very intact, very cohesive. There's no single ductal epithelial cells. There's a little bit of crowding and hyperchromasia that goes along with the hyperplasia we see with these. Very nice example of ductal epithelial cells here that look benign. But in addition, I mean, not as large as some of the other groups that we saw in the other slides, but this sometimes they'll be smaller. Um, but the, what we're highlighting here is the stromal fragments that are very nicely metachromatic on display. And you'll see quite a few of these. I, I do like to see these fragments to make the diagnosis, okay? And usually you see abundant fragments like this, and it, that really helps. And then, of course, you have uh, what else? Myolapse, yes. Here's another example, again, showing you how hyperplastic the epithelial component can sometimes be. But the key feature is noting that it's benign. There's not a lot of overlap here. There's very uniform appearance to the nuclei, and you've got your myoepsis in the background, as well as within the group, too. Now, this is where, um, again, this is highlighting the myoepithelial component. Again, notice here on this example, you do have epithelial cells, but actually what you see mostly are myoepsis in the background, a whole bunch of them. And then you've got a stromal fragment here. And then higher power, this is actually taken right from DeMay. Um, higher power here shows you the, um, the myoepithelial cells with their very characteristic appearance. Now this one actually does happen to have a little bit of atypia associated with it because the epithelial cells are starting, the groups are showing a little bit of dis discohesion. And there's some single cells here with intact cytoplasm. Uh, but there are some myoepsis in the background, which, you know, kind of favors it to be benign. But if, And you may see this um, a little bit on some of your examples of very cellular fibroadenomas. And I don't get too worried about it unless it really becomes a very prominent feature. And then I'd probably call it atypical. And here's one that actually had some mucinous material associated with it. Sometimes fibroadenomas, when they get large, can undergo degeneration. and and, and collect some mucin. Uh, again, if I see it, I mention it, but it really probably doesn't mean much in this setting. Just a degenerative change. All right, let me see where we are, and then, okay. All right, I'm gonna finish up with the, the benign things, and then we'll take a break. Is that okay with you? Okay, good. All right, the um, introductal papillomas, where do they normally occur? Uh, in the sub-areolar areas or where the larger ducts are. Um, it tends to cause a bloody discharge. So, uh, and, and these lesions actually tend to have a lot of blood on the cytology as well. They tend to be quite cellular, moderate to high cellularity, with very characteristic three-dimensional papillary configurations that can get relatively complex. Uh, you see, we'll talk, now again, papillary lesions like to give up their ductal cells occasionally, and you'll see occasional tall form their cells in the background. But with the benign lesion, you should see very few of those. With the malignant ones, you tend to see more. Okay, malignant papillary lesions, we'll see, we'll see an example next. Um, and you look for the two cell types among the papillary groups, your epithelial cells as well as your myoepsis, because their presence will favor benign condition, okay? Now, the differential is always papillary carcinoma, either in base. No, papillary carcinoma is a variant of ductal carcinoma. I, I didn't mention, I, I'm not sure I mentioned that yesterday, but just to make it clear, it is a, one of the variants of ductal carcinoma. Um, it can either be invasive or in situ, just like all ductal carcinomas. And, um, and so you're going to have to make sure that you don't undercall a papillary carcinoma. But again, Papillary carcinoma, we haven't talked about the carcinomas yet, so I'll wait till the next part when we do that. And, and probably because these papillary lesions can have such complexity to them, to their lesions, and sometimes it's hard to make out the myoepsis. Um, oftentimes they get interpreted as papillary lesion recommend excision because it's sometimes on cytology it can be very hard to tell 
especially when you're dealing with a very complex papillary structure, whether it really is benign or malignant. So it's better to actually, in the, when I'm dealing with a very complex papillary lesion on cytology and I can't tell um, that it's clearly benign or, I'm, or there might be something in it, a malignant there, I will just, it's in, a completely appropriate to say papillary lesion recommend excision, really. But here's a classic example of a benign introductal papilloma. And you can actually see it's a very large sheet of epithelial cells with, you notice this uh, metachromatic material in the it's scattered throughout. That represents the fibrovascular stalks of the papillary lesion, right? Just like you see in any other papillary lesion. You see these uh, very classically, see these finger-like projections of fibrovascular stalks that are lined by the columnar uh, ductal epithelial cells as well as myoaps. And there's cohesion to this group, which is good, and there may be a few mile Fs in the background. Here's one on higher power where you don't have as cohesive as a papillary structure, but the ductal cells are forming some loose papillary structures here. They even have some African metaplastic cells associated with them and a few isolated tall columnar cells, which kind of raises, and then some myoaps here as well. But again, when you start to see a few isolated cells, to me, it kind of raises a little bit of a red flag to me. And this kind of lesion, I'd probably call it typical. But it did turn out to be a papilloma. Now, what about gynecomastia in, the, in, a, in a male? Um, I told you yesterday on histology, they look just like fibroadenomas. Well, it's exactly what they look like on cytology. Um, again, just like we've already talked about. They're usually very cellular. You'll usually see uniform uh, cells in very tight clusters and groups that can look hyperplastic. Uh, there may be some nuclear overlapping, but there's definitely cohesion to the epithelial groups. There's usually new abundant myoepithelial cells as well as stromal fragments. So again, it sounds like I'm just describing a fibroadenoma, right? So if you see this appearance in a male, then uh, you know you're probably dealing with gynecomastia, and notice here we have our cohesive group of ductal epithelial cells, a stromal fragment right here, and myoaps, easily found gynecomastia. Again, you have to know the sex of the patient here to be able to call it that for sure, right? Usually you do. Okay, the... Um, I mean, sometimes you wonder about, you know, if you're not the one there doing the FNA, if you weren't at the bedside and they don't give you any clinical history, it can be challenging. <laughs> so hopefully they would tell you at least that it was a guy, right? <laughs> All right, here's another example showing you these very hyperplastic ductal epithelial groups with some myoeps in the background. Again, stag horn appearance, the antler horn appearance is just typical for these hyperplastic ductal groups. Again here, uh, there are some myoaps in the background, in addition to the very benign appearing ductal epithelial cells that look a little bit hyperplastic, a little bit overlapping, but otherwise benign. And that's it for the benign things. Um, let's take a, uh, any questions so far? All right, let's take a, about a, let's take a, a break until about, uh, let's see, it's almost five after 10. And we'll get, come back and, and look at the uh, malignant conditions, okay? <laughs> test, test, test. Is it working? Should be. Okay, good. All right, well, let's go on with the malignant lesions of the breast. Um, just some general cytologic features to be aware of that will help you overall in trying to distinguish um, it from benign. Uh, these tend to be very hyper. Exercise, exercise. <laughs> 
tend to be very cellular aspirates. You tend to see a lot of discohesive clusters with single isolated malignant cells with intact cytoplasm. And then of course, nuclear atypia, which can you know include nuclear enlargement, high NC ratio, crowding, and isonucleosis, irregular clumping of the chromatin, membrane irregularities, theomorphism, prominent irregular nucleoli, just other th you know, things that you're used to looking as far as looking for nuclear atypia. Now, I, this is a, you won't find this published anywhere. I think I heard about this once when I was at a conference so many years ago, but I kind of like it because it seems to apply pretty well. And if you kind of lump these into four main categories, the cellularity, the discohesion, this presence of single cells uh, with intact cytoplasm, and then the cytal individual nuclear atypia, um, if you have all four of these features present, um, generally that's a good, that's a very good indication that you're dealing with something malignant. So all four present is definitely positive. Now, if you only have three of four of those present, you know, what if you have nuclear atypia, but it's not cellular, you know, or for instance, I mean, that's probably one of the key findings. If you don't have a cellular specimen, but yet you have nuclear atypia, um, Maybe you'd call it suspicious. Or if you if you have um, occasional, a rare isolated malignant cell with nuclear atypia, but you don't have any disco, you know, you don't have any cellularity or discohesion of the clusters, then maybe atypical is better to go with. But again, for your purposes right now, you need to recognize when it's truly positive, okay? And those are the general features of all malignancies in the breast. Now, now we're going to look at ductal, you know, the general category of ductal carcinomas along with its variants. And then we'll look at lobular and then some of the um, very rare types of cancers. Now, again, what's the most common cancer we see in the breast? Usually ductal variety. Now, notice here that the slide only says ductal carcinoma and not otherwise specified. It doesn't say in situ or invasive because guess what? In situ and invasive carcinoma, of ductal and lobular carcinomas, when you look at them as separate categories of lobular and ductal, look, you can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference between in situ and invasive lesions on cytology. So you need to be aware of that. Okay, they all look very similar. Um, but in general, ductal carcinomas have very high cellularity. Uh, it's a homogenous population of atypical cells. Numerous single cells with cytoplasm, uh, you know, and therefore you have discohesion of the epithelial cell groups. You don't see any myo-eps. In other words, there's absent bare nuclei. Uh, nuclear enlargement, at least two times the size of an RBC uh, with irregular nuclear membranes, nucleoli. Eccentric nuclear placement is common, especially in ductal, and it'll make it look like, kind of like give it this plasma cytoid appearance. That's a good feature. And oftentimes there's necrosis or tumor diaphysis in the background. You don't have to have that, okay, um, but it, it is a notable feature to, to, make, to make note of. All right, so here's some examples from low power, very cellular specimens. You look at this, remember what I told you, there's two things that can give you this much cellularity, cancer and fibroadenomas, okay? And then you got to look closer to see what you're dealing with. Um, but very cellular specimens, uh, I, I think even from this power, you can see that there's some smaller groups and even a single cell. It looks pretty large from this power. Uh, and so that this, the cellularity is important as well as the dishesion of the groups to make note of initially. Then when you look closer, you see that there's actually quite a bit of discohesion of the groups. And if there are groups, they're crowded and overlapped. Um, and then if you, you easily find single cells with retained cytoplasm, you see an example here, maybe one down here. Um, it's just basically a lot of discohesion. And what I don't see are any myo-Fs. And then when you look at the individual cells, they are showing some evidence, albeit to a, this one's more of a low-grade tumor, uh, of nuclear atypia, including pleomorphism, irregular nuclear membranes. You'll see little bites in the nuclear membranes and so forth. Oh, okay. Hold on one second. It's the, it's the car plates. Do you mind? Hold on a second. 
<laughs> Sorry. Hello. All right, so ductal carcinomas, again, dyshesion, single cells, lack of myo-apps, nuclear atypia, um, hypercellularity. Okay. If you recognize that it is an adenocarcinoma, that's probably a, a good finding, right? All right, here's an example of a higher grade tumor. Okay, now, again, you still have some groups here, but notice what the individual the groups here are very crowded and disordered. And the nuclei are very atypical, pleomorphic. There's prominent nucleoli that you can even see on the dip click. Um, maybe uh, mitosis right there. Um, so very ugly looking cells. So it's no question these are malignant. You know, the question for you comes down to, is it benign? I mean, is it ductal or is it lobular, right? When you get to malignancy. Or is it one of the variants of ductal? But this is just a, this is a high grade ductal carcinoma, not otherwise specified. All right, so Demay says, and this are images taken right from Demay, he says, you generally have lots of cells to look at. And again, he's highlighting the overall cellularity. You can also appreciate the discohesion here in this presence of lots of single cells. And that look malignant. Okay, sounds easy enough, right? Um, and indeed, when you look at them closely, you'll see that there's definitely malignant nuclear features. There's... Um, uh, notice also here that uh, the uh, there's uh, the single cells have abundant cytoplasm, which is you know another it's another feature, and then you have um, these what's called these targetoid mucin vacuoles, which is also a feature of both ductal and lobular carcinoma. When you see these targetoid mucin vacuoles, now again tumors can be low grade, they can be high grade, generally. Um, I won't grade them on cytology. We do on biopsy for sure. Um, but you have to be aware that there are these differences because they're all not going to look really ugly. Okay. Now, this is an example of a low-grade ductal carcinoma, and you can definitely make out nuclear atypia. There's no question. Look at the little, um, uh, what I like to describe as nubbins of nuclear material there. Kind of That's abnormal. You've got irregular chromatin distribution. You've got prominent irregular nucleoli in some of the cells. But again, the, the, and, and what's interesting to note is that the, um, there is some cohesion here, but there is at the same time some discohesion because you know it's not like a flat group with regular placement of the nuclei. It's kind of irregularly placed. Now here's one that's high grade. And again, I think you can appreciate the fact that there's certainly more nuclear pleomorphism, anaplasia, uh, mitotic activity is really pronounced, uh, really malignant looking nuclei. With, and in ductal, you tend to see a fair amount, you can see a fair amount of cytoplasm. And that's important to know. All right, so with all of that, okay, which one is benign, which one is malignant? Yeah, every, everyone agree. Pretty straightforward, actually. I mean, this is a nice cohesive cluster of ductal epithelial cells with small, round, regularly placed nuclei. And over here, you don't have, you know, you have total disruption of any epithelial group. They're very pleomorphic, uh, very a lot in size and shape. So in other words, there's anisonucleosis, very irregular chromatin, very um, pronounced nucleoli, et cetera, et cetera. So. All right. But I told you earlier that it's very hard to distinguish uh, invasive from in situ carcinoma, um, but there are some features to be aware of, okay? Uh, we do not make the distinction on cytology. Basically, if we call it malignant, we call it either ductal or lobular, okay, on cyto, or one of the ductal, or a ductal with one of the features that favor a variant like colloid carcinoma or papillary carcinoma or something like that. But um, it's, you know, if it's malignant, I call it, I try to make the distinction between ductal and lobular. Sometimes you can't even do that, but it helps. And, and you're going to have to make that distinction. 
correct between ductal and lobular carcinoma on cytology. So I just want you to be aware of that. But I don't think you're, you're not going to have to make the distinction between invasive and in situ carcinoma with the exception, one minor exception, of recognizing the possibility of the comedo variant. And we talked about that yesterday. Um, the comedo variant will, is the one that will have a, abundant necrotic material in the background, as well as, uh, so it's a really pronounced tumor diathesis. And, and they show abundant calcium material as well. Uh, and in addition, the cells look very malignant, so they're very pleomorphic um, ductal cells. So that's actually uh, some very characteristic findings of comedial carcinoma. Uh, the non-comedial variants are usually your low and intermediate grade DCIS. Again, they can be often hard to tell apart from atypia or atypical ductal hyperplasia. So this can be a, and oftentimes they get lumped into that atypical category. Now, there are some features that you can um, recognize that might hint towards an invasive process. First of all, if the, the, neat, the lesion that's being sampled by FNA or core biopsy is palpable and firm and rock hard and can't be moved, uh, that is most likely an invasive lesion because in situ lesions are usually not palpable, okay? So if someone tells you that they're aspirating a palpable, hard density that um, mammography shows um, a stellate border to its density. Those are all features that you are associated with an invasive lesion. Um, in situ lesions are usually non-palpable and usually are only picked up on mammography by presence of um, irregular calcifications, for instance. We talked about that yesterday. And so if on cytology you see tumor cells infiltrating stromal fragments, that's a good sign too. And also some studies have shown that if you see the presence of targetoid mucin vacuoles, I showed you one earlier, uh, is also, you tend to see that more often in invasive lesions too. Now, I wouldn't use that as a 100% rule, but it's, you know, it's a clue. All right, so here's an example of comedocarcinoma. Again, notice how dirty the background looks. Very dirty. Most, you know, I mean, again, you can see diathesis in invasive lesions too, but this is really pronounced. And, and, and sometimes you'll see some calcium material, which I don't see here, but you definitely see groups of ductal, malignant ductal cells that are very anaplastic, very high grade. And in contrast, this is a low grade DCIS. Now, this can be hard to tell apart from benign because sometimes the groups look cohesive and, and you may see a rare, of, you know, I know I said no myoepsin cancer, but sometimes in DCIS, you know, think about it, the in situ carcinomas fill up a duct, but there may be a few myoepsin are remaining around that expanded duct, okay? So you may see a few myoepsin in that setting, but the features here that are definitely atypical are the fact that you do have crowding, you do have a regular placement of the nuclei, and you do have nuclear atypia, for sure. This kind of lesion would be called atypical and would end up needing a biopsy, but it turned out to be a low grade on histology. Another example, again, um, increased cellularity, um, some single cells, but really mild nuclear atypia. You see some mitoses here. You know, this is kind of a, definitely a low-grade carcinoma, and it happened to be an in situ one. All right, so I mentioned to you about targetoid vacuoles. Uh, again, you see some on PAP. You see one here on DIFQUIC from DeMaze. Uh, again, what it looks like is this kind of round vacuole with this targetoid material in the center, kind of making it look like a target. And it's actually mostly it's mucin that's found within those vacuoles. And these are, uh, sometimes you'll hear them referred to as intracytoplasmic lumina. Um, again, these are all features that you tend to see in malignancy, and you can see them in both ductal and lobular carcinomas. We mentioned that there's a number of variants of ductal carcinoma, and here are some of the variants that uh, we've talked mostly about all of these with the exception of metaplastic, and I'll talk about that in a little, a little bit. Um, but... Um, Let's look at some examples so you can see some of the variety. Now remember, these are all types of ductal carcinoma. Uh, and they just, if you see this as a, on cytology, it's really 
cough can be hard to call a specific variant, but if I see abundant mucin, I'm going to mention that, okay? That there's abundant mucin on this particular um, preparation, which may indicate the presence of a colloid carcinoma. But sometimes your just your straightforward invasive ductal carcinomas on cytology may show, you know, some scattered lymphocytes and may show some scattered tubules, some a few papillae. So it's often hard to classify these, you know, further on cytology other than malignant consistent with ductal carcinoma. Um, but if I do see an abundance of one feature or the other, I think I will usually put it in the comment of the report. Now this is an example, and you'll probably this is probably the only example you'll see <laughs> of medullary carcinoma. I don't think we have we don't have a study set of it because I don't think they do in the in their study set files. I didn't see one, but I know Mr. Franco was asking if I had any, but we just, we haven't, it's such a rare tumor. Most of them are being classified just as invasive ductal NLS nowadays. But the, um, basically what you see here, remember medullary is the one where you see the syncytial aggregates of high grade ductal cells with abundant lymphocytes in the background, okay? And what do we see here? lymphocytes all over the place in the background. These are not myoats, these are lymphocytes, which tend to be rounder with more coarse clumped chromatin. Now these are the malignant cells right here, and this is a crowded syncytial aggregate of um, epithelial cells with vesicular nuclei, uh, prominent nucleoli, and um, kind of pale cytoplasm. Now here's an example, we, I may have shown one, a similar one yesterday with a colloid or mucinous carcinoma. And again, the key finding is the abundant mucin in the background. Um, but to call it malignant, obviously you still have to see, you know, the malignant epithelial component. But you, this mucin material will often stand out in the background. And here it is on DIFQUIC, it looks metachromatic on DIFQUIC, and then you've got the groups of malignant epithelial cells here, which are often quite bland, usually a low-grade carcinoma, but you've got individual cells here that are in malignant cells that are actually embedded within this mucinous material. Here it is on PAP stain, again, kind of a sheet, a film, I should say, of, of mus blue mucinous material with scattered um, malignant groups and individual ductal cells within it. These sometimes are not very cellular, but I mean, that's why it's important to look closely at these smears with abundant mucin. Here it is at higher power, to, you can appreciate the nuclear atypia, the crowding of the group, some of the individual cells here and here that are um, uh, malignant cells as well. Tubular carcinoma, I think I showed an example of this yesterday on histology. It's basically a uh, ductal, uh, well, a, a low-grade or well-differentiated ductal carcinoma with abundant tubule formation. And it, it kind of recapitulates on cytology. You get this kind of tubule that has what some people describe as a cornucopia appearance. You've heard that term before with Thanksgiving, right? Right? Cornucopia, that's your uh, thing, your baskets that you put on your Thanksgiving table. Anyways, that's kind of because what it looks like it will have kind of a a, a small tapered end and a wider, uh, the opposite end will be, look a little wider so it can give you that appearance, or it'll look comma shaped like you see here. Now you're thinking to yourself, how do you call this malignant, right? I mean, because first of all, the group is fairly cohesive, right? I don't see any individual cells, but there there is a fair amount of nuclear atypia in these given cells. But again, it's not surprising that a lot of these cases are called um, uh, may be called atypical, and sometimes are called mistakenly called benign. Okay, so it can be a a, a, a reason for a false negative because the, the atypia is so minimal usually. Here's another example, and again, um, this is good because you actually have a comparison with the normal. Here you've got what look like benign ductal epithelial cells. Here, here's the malignant, forming this tubular structure, and you can see the difference in nuclear size here. It's definitely quite pronounced. And over here, you definitely see some chromatin irregularities, some targetoid mucin vacuoles. See that? There's actually several of them, one there, one there, one there. But again, the key feature is the tubular um, appearance. 
papillary carcinoma. We talked about introductal papilloma earlier, the benign uh, papillary lesion, but this one, you can definitely appreciate that there's a papillary architecture here, but when you actually look at the overall um, group and then the individual cells, you're going to find some definitely some atypical features. First of all, there are single cells. There's some discohesion. Uh, there's many more epithelial cells than you expect. It doesn't have that nice uh, rimming of the fibrovascular structures. With you know, here you see too many epithelial cells. Excuse me again. It's it's um, hopefully it's it is in. okay. All right. So here's this example of papillary carcinoma. And again, you notice the epithelial component is very crowded and disordered. It doesn't have that nice layering that we saw in the papillomas where you, you see the myoaps and then you see maybe one or two layers of epithelial cells lining fibrovascular stalks. It's lost that appearance, but you can still appreciate that there's some papillary. I know you're looking at this thinking, how do I know this is not a fibroadenoma? You showed us something like that before, right? But you know what? Um, first of all, there's no myoaps, right? There's no myoepithelial cells. There's a lot of blood in the background. These lesions tend to be quite bloody, and you often will see some hemocytin-laden macrophages as well because of all the blood. But again, the crowding, the uh, nuclear tipia, the scattered individual single cells, the abundant blood in the background, hemocytin-laden macrophages, these are features that would favor a papillary carcinoma. And here's another example. Again, here you can appreciate the complex papillary architecture but again, when you look at this, you don't see any myoaps. You don't see that rimming, you know, of one or two cell layers along fibrovascular stalks. It's much thicker, more disordered. You've got some individual cells and smaller groups, so there is some dyshesion. Again, absent myoepithelial cells. Here's another example showing you some of the smaller groups that are have um, um, kind of shedded from the larger complex papillary fragment. And then you see over here, this is a hemocytin-laden macrophage right here, and lots of blood in the background. You've got a single cell here. There's nuclear atypia. You've got a small group of cells here. Now notice here how they kind of retain a tall columnar shape to them. And that's actually a feature of papillary carcinoma. You tend to see quite, you can see quite a few of those um, here. And here, here it is on cell block. And you can appreciate how they're more than two cell layers thick here. You still have a core with, guess what, some foamy macrophages within the core. That's kind of interesting. But um, again, this turned out to be a papillary carcinoma as well. And here as well. And this is to kind of highlight the papillary architecture that's really quite thickened and disordered and with individual cell atypia. But then over here, you see the smaller fragment of cells um, with the, the cells are retaining that tall columnar appearance. That's kind of a helpful feature with papillary carcinoma. It almost looks like a little picket fence arrangement there, and you tend to see that in this lesion. All right, what about inflammatory carcinoma? Now, I showed you this yesterday where the whole breast looks reddened and swollen and inflamed. It uh, has that peau de orange appearance because of the edema and what it represents is ductal, malignant ductal cells usually within superficial dermal lymphatics. Here's the epidermis here. Here's the lymphatics that are filled with tumor cells just beneath the epidermis. Uh, again, why would anyone do an FNA of this? They have to do a, really do a biopsy, but there actually are people that have done this and have done reports on actually doing very superficial, very superficial FNAs uh, into this. Um, lesion using like a TB tuberculin sized needle or something. But anyways, the um, what do you find? Well, basically you find malignant ductal cells. Okay, it's not going to look any different. If they, usually not as cellular as you might see in, in a tumor cells taken from a tr uh, the, the tumor mass. But um, because, you know, I, I think it's hard to sample lymphatics using an FNA approach. You, you definitely would it would be much better to get a little punch biopsy, or at least of the skin. But again, what do you, you, all you look for are malignant ductal cells, and you're going to see crowded groups, isolated cells with nuclear atypia. Now, we didn't talk about metaplastic carcinoma yesterday, but this is a rare form 
of carcinoma in the breast that um, shows mixed features. It's kind of like a kind of it resembles a carcinosarcoma that you can see in the in the female genital tract, and it'll kind of have mixed appearance. It will have a malignant epithelial component as well as a malignant stromal component. And so you kind of see a, a whole mixture of tumor types here. And sometimes the epithelial component will look um, squamous, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And so it's, you tend to, like I said, you see this malignant epithelial component, this malignant stromal component. Uh, it's basically a carcinosarcoma. And the epithelial component can look glandular, it can look squamous, it can even look like small cell carcinoma, okay? It really can have a whole mixture of features. So it's important to appreciate that um, mixed of appearance. Here is an, an example of a case that I actually had at, um, at Tripler Army Medical Center uh, a few years ago. And um, uh, I remember this patient very well. Uh, it was a very interesting case. I think it even was published. The histology was published, actually. Um, this patient presented with chest pain to the ER. So what happens when you get, you know, you come to the chest with chest pain to the ER, you get admitted for a rule-out MI workup, basically. And um, uh, they, ruled, well, they ruled out her MI. You know, they did all her appropriate, the appropriate studies for cardiac workup acute cardiac workup and, and it was all negative. And then they did the thallium study, which is not a study they do as much anymore in the workup of MI patients, but they did then. And um, the thallium study showed this massive uptake in the breast, you know, like huge amount of uptake in the breast area, not in the heart, okay, in the breast, okay. And so then they decided, well, maybe we ought to do a physical exam of her breast. <laughs> So the patient was admitted, they didn't do, you know, okay, I understand, she was a heart patient, maybe you're not going to focus in on the breast area, okay, but they, so they went back and after the thallium study realized, wow, she has this eight centimeter rock hard mass in her breast, okay, and that was what took up the thallium, and that's how it got detected, and then they asked me to do an FNA on it, and I said, are you sure this thing is really rock hard, it was like bone, okay, I mean, and, and I, but I gave it a good college try, okay, <laughs> good army try, and, and sure enough, I was able to get some material, but not a whole lot, okay. What you see on these slides is not much more than what was, uh, well, there was, there was more. I actually have a couple slides from it, and I have it for the workshop to show you, but it was very interesting, and the reason it was rock hard is because it did have bone in it, okay. So that was really quite the experience. But um, a malignant looking, actually what it had was osteoclasts, in it, um, from, which is not uncommon in some metaplastic breast carcinomas. But what you're seeing here from this same patient I'm describing is a malignant epithelial component, uh, some very large, bizarre looking cells. Over here, you actually see some metachromatic stroma with embedded, very pleomorphic, atypical cells. Uh, in that stroma. And here's the example of the osteoclast-like cell, and then uh, another cell that looked outright malignant. Now, the osteoclast cells were actually benign, but they were there gobbling up some bony material that had been deposited within this tumor, okay? And there were actually more of these cells than anything else on the cytology. So I'm kind of surprised I actually got them, but um, we did, and it just turned out to be very interesting case, and it turned out to be a metaplastic uh, breast carcinoma that had both malignant epithelial and stromal, and stromal elements. Now, what about Paget's disease? Again, this the way Paget's disease might uh, present in cytology is doing a scraping of the nipple, okay? Uh, it's not, you know, Paget's itself does not cause, you know, a mass. The Paget's is just what's involving the nipple. Now, there may be a mass elsewhere in the breast, and usually there is, of the primary tumor site, but this Paget's disease, remember, is involving the nipple and the areola, and the way to see these um, cytologic preparations is to do a scraping of the skin or touch prep of the skin sample. Now, I would imagine a scraping would be better, be more cellular, but nevertheless, what you see here, uh, Paget cells, just like in the vulva, are very large and pleomorphic with abundant cytoplasm. Uh, and so that's what we're seeing here, malignant cells with um, 
prominent nucleoli, very large um, abundant cytoplasm. All right, now what about, you know, we, we've talked mostly now about ductal and all its variants, and, and now we want to talk about lobular carcinoma briefly here. Lobular carcinoma is not as common, but it is, I think it is important to recognize the differences from ductal carcinoma, and you'll be able to, and you'll be one of your calls you're going to have to make between lobular and ductal carcinoma. The, the thing with lobular carcinoma is that it's not usually as cellular, okay, than ductal carcinoma, and that's one of the reasons why it may be a cause of a false negative diagnosis because of its lower cellularity. The cells are also smaller, okay? Um, they tend to have scanty cytoplasm. They tend to be have more uniform appearing nuclei, but they can show nuclear molding, they can be nuclear membrane irregularities, and it can show coarse irregular chromatin. Um, the cells may actually show up in single files uh, on the cytologic preparation, just like you saw in, in the histology. The one feature that I see commonly, uh, not commonly, sometimes in lobular carcinoma, is occasionally they look like signet ring cells and they'll have these targetoid vacuoles, and because the cells are rather small, it makes them look like signet ring cells. And so that's a feature to, to look for. And again, these two, basically a lobular carcinoma will kind of resemble a small cell carcinoma that you've seen in the lung or other places, um, but not as many cells, and not as, not as, uh, as much necrosis in the background. But it is, they do have some overlapping features. It can also resemble lymphoma, and it can also resemble, um, it's also resemble a low-grade ductal carcinoma that's not very cellular, so you always have to keep that in mind. Here's an example of lobular carcinoma. Again, you can definitely appreciate the nuclear atypia. Um, there's crowding in this group, but there's not a whole lot of cells. Um, there's, um, there's definitely some molding. You see the molding here, nuclear molding? There's definitely nuclear membrane irregularities. So, I mean, you can definitely call these atypical, but what if this is all you have on the entire smear, okay? Is that going to be enough to call it outright cancer? Well, it did turn out to be cancer, but this is the situation that we sometimes are in. And here's another example with some signet ring cell features. I told you that sometimes they'll look like signet ring cells. Here it is on histology. Um, here it is on cyto, and you can see here there's more individual cells. Uh, with this targetoid mucin vacuole. Here, the, here it is again in kind of a column, kind of this single cell arrangement, maybe two cells next to each other, but it tends to form this almost like these tubules here again, with very high NC ratio, but nuclear atypia that is appreciated. Here's another example from DeMay, and again, he's highlighting here as well the targetoid vacuoles the plasmacytoid appearance to these cells. You notice these cells just don't have as much cytoplasm as ductal. Ductal tends to have a lot more cytoplasm. Uh, and again, the single file arrangement here is not uncommon, even on cytology. Okay, so with that information in mind, which one is ductal and which one is lobular? That's it, you know, they're both malignant. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Because, because why? That's, that's, well, the cellularity looks about even for both. But yeah, the size is probably the key feature. Yeah, no, there are tiger toy mucin vacuoles here. That is correct. But I told you earlier, you can actually see mucin vacuoles in ductal as well. So you can't use that feature alone. When I see them, I tend to see them more often in lobular, but you do see them in ductal too. But the key, the other finding is that they're the size. Yes, these cells are bigger because they have much more abundant cytoplasm. The nuclei are bigger overall. They're much more pleomorphic looking. The nuclei in lobular, although malignant, um, are smaller and more uniform in appearance. Yes, so lobular, ductal. All right, so some very unusual tumors of the breast to be aware of. Um, you know, lymphoid tumors can occur in the breast. Most often when they occur, it's because it has disseminated from another site, right, in the body. It, I mean, primary lymphomas can occur in the breast, but very rare. 
Uh, sarcomas uh, can occur in the breast too, but again, are also very rare. Uh, except Floaties tumor, the malignant Floaties tumor, we're going to talk about momentarily. And metastatic tumors can also occur to the breast. Now, here's an example. You haven't done your lymphoid unit yet, right? Okay, you will soon. Um, the, this is an example of a large cell lymphoma. Uh, you do have some blood cells in the background here for size. Actually, that, that's a blood cell, but that's actually a lymphoglandular body. These little fragments of blue material actually uh, represent fragments of the cytoplasm of the very fragile malignant lymphocytes. You'll hear more about those when you do the lymphoid unit. So lymphoglandular bodies, a little preview there. But again, lymphoid lesions tend to be isolated cells with a very high NC ratio and a kind of a dense blue, dark blue cytoplasm. Here's a Hodgkin's disease where you look for, you've got normal lymphocytes in the background with a central Reed Sternberg cell here, which is your classic uh, uh, cell seen in Hodgkin's disease, bilobed, large bilobed uh, uh, nucleus. Angiosarcomas can, you know, represent a vascular tumor, and you can appreciate the um, kind of spindle-shaped cells here that are forming the glomeruloid configuration. Um, these cells look malignant based on their nuclear features, and there's abundant blood and broken-down blood in the background. It's very characteristic of this um, vascular tumor. And now the Floaties tumors. Now, I, I am going to talk about Floaties tumors here, both the benign and malignant varieties, because, you know, they, they show um, a kind of a spectrum of features to be aware of. Floaties tumors are biphasic tumors composed of epithelial and stromal elements. There's benign and there's malignant forms. There's an in-between category, which you don't really need to know about, but um, for your purposes, the malignant form is also known as cystosarcoma pelodes. And then um, cytologically, the epithelial component in all forms of the tumor is benign and resembles that seen in a fibroadenoma. Okay, it's very, they're very hypercellular ductal cells. It's the stromal component that determines what type of tumor it is, whether it's benign or malignant. Um, and, and also to help distinguish it from a fibroadenoma, because you'll look at it and say, well, why is it not a fibroadenoma? Okay, well, the stromal component in a Floaties tumor, even a benign one, is much more cellular, okay? And in fact, some people, ref and there's more of it, okay? There's a lot of stroma with a lot of cellularity. And some folks refer to those fragments as Floaties fragments, okay? Now, they're composed of variably atypical pleomorphic spindle cells within those stromal fragments. And the more atypical they get, the more bizarre they get, um, that may indicate a malignant process. So it's the stromal component that determines whether the tumor is benign or malignant. Now, here's an example of a benign Floaties tumor. And uh, here's the epithelial component that looks hyperplastic. Just like you'd see in a fibroadenoma, there's probably even some myoepithelial cells in the background. But the key finding here is the stroma. This right here is a stromal fragment. Here it is on higher power to show you that there's, there'll, first of all, there'll be more of these stromal elements and they'll be much more cellular than you uh, were saw with a fibroadenoma. If you recall with a fibroadenoma, you saw a lot more of the metachromatic stromal material you don't see that as much here. It's mostly spindled, oval-shaped cells that represent the uh, stromal cells. Now here they're not very pleomorphic. They're not mitotically active. Um, there's not single stromal cells here in the background, so it all favors something benign. Now in contrast, this is a malignant Floaties tumor. And you note here the ductal component looks benign. Okay, it's very cohesive, very regularly arranged. It's the stromal component that looks very concerning. Uh, it's very cellular. There's lots of individual cells that are kind of falling off and trailing off the group of stromal cells. Um, there's pleomorphism. Uh, you're, you should, you know, you usually see mitoses, although I can't really point them out here. Um, so you, you look at all of that to, to really make the call for malignancy. Now, 
Um, going on to metastatic tumors, they're very rare in the breast, uh, may be able, um, uh, may be difficult to differentiate from some primary breast tumors. The most common to metastasize in decreasing uh, frequency are melanoma, lymphoma, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, soft tissue sarcomas, uh, gastrointestinal and GU uh, primaries. In the men, it's prostate cancer that can go to the, uh, the nipple area or subareolar area. All right, so here's an example of melanoma. Melanoma is the great masquerader, as you know. It can look like any tumor, but most often it shows up as single cells with a single large malignant cells with eccentric nuclear placement, plasmacytoid appearance, uh, intranuclear inclusions, uh, prominent nucleoli. Doesn't this look like some of the ductal carcinomas they showed earlier with a plasmacytoid appearance, right? Okay, so you got to be, you got, oh, well, if there's pigment there, that would be helpful, right? But pigment only occurs about 40% of the time, <laughs> okay? So, you know, it's not going to be all that helpful. I think, um, and some are binucleated, as you see here. Melanoma likes to be binucleated occasionally. Um, so it's, uh, it's important to know the history in this setting, that's for sure. Small cell carcinoma, say from the lung, can metastasize to the breast. This is under high power, of course. Um, I think it's under oil, actually. But uh, again, you, you've got uh, lots of cells with pronounced nuclear molding, hyperchromasia, mitotic activity, um, very, very little cytoplasm, so very characteristic of um, small cell carcinoma. Here it is as um, pap stain, and some of the nuclei are a little bit more oval shaped, but you definitely have molding, hyperchromasia, um, and lots of necrosis, both individual cell and background necrosis, and mitotic activity. Well, squam can also metastasize to the breast or any site, and you just got to pick out some of the squamoid elements. You've got cells here with abundant. Uh, dense amorphous cytoplasm, even tails of cytoplasm, kind of almost looks like a tap hole there. And urothelial carcinoma from the bladder can meta I've seen this actually a case I did at William Beaumont. And when I first saw this, I thought it was breast cancer because, you know, they didn't tell me she had a history of bladder cancer. So when you look at this, you know, this is why history is so important sometimes. And you look at it and you think, oh well, gosh, it could be a ductal. It looks just like a ductal. Any ductal carcinoma could look like uh, single cells with plasma cytoid features. And, you know, I mean, maybe the cytoplasm is not as dense as sometimes you see with ductal carcinoma, but it, um, it sure could resemble it. But it turned out this was turned out to be um, uh, metastatic um, urothelial carcinoma from the bladder. All right. So there are some limitations of breast FNA. Again, we can't tell the difference on cytology between in situ and invasive ductal or lobular carcinomas. Uh, tissue is needed for that. Um, atypical ductal hyperplasia versus low-grade DCIS can be difficult and a, a challenge. Papillary lesions, you know, whether it's benign versus malignant, can be a challenge. Lactational changes can add. Um, some difficulties into the uh, breast FNA interpretation because of the cellularity and the dishesion of the, those cells. Lobular carcinomas, because of their low cellularity, oftentimes are mistaken and called benign when they are malignant. Um, fibroadenomas that are often very cellular, and if they have some cellular atypia associated with them, um, can be overcalled as malignant. All right, now this is from your handout. I'm going to sneeze in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe not. Okay. Um, these are the NCI recommendations for breast FNA reports in general. This is something to be aware of when you actually get ready to sign out cases, real cases. Again, like every non-GIN, we always do NGIN. We always do a specimen adequacy assessment. There are five general diagnostic categories, benign, atypical, suspicious, malignant, or unsat. And if it is unsat or inadequate, you should give a reason. And of course, you have your, you then provide your descriptive findings like, you know, what, uh, abundant um, hyperplastic ductal epithelial cell groups present uh, along with uh, 
stromal fragments and abundant myoepithelial cells consistent with fibroadenoma, right? Okay, that's kind of an example. Or just malignant cells present consistent with ductal carcinoma, okay? That, that says it too, right, for a malignant case. All right, so the important thing is to always, always, always correlate your, and this is especially true with breast FNAs, always correlate the cytology with the physical exam and imaging findings, be it, you know, ultrasound, mammography, or MRI. Uh, it's a, and it's, the goal is to help reduce the false negative and false positive findings. If there are discrepancies amongst any of those findings, that would be a clue for the surgeon or who the radiologist or whomever uh, is to get a, bi a tissue biopsy before doing any more um, for follow-up. And the, the whole thing is this call, it's referred to as the triple test. That is truly its name, triple test. Um, actually reduces the false negative rate significantly so that it's almost like a surgical biopsy. Okay, it's the same false negative rate. FNA has still, even F, FNA has a false negative rate. Core biopsies have false negative rates. Mammography, well, it's better now. It's probably closer to 10%. And palpation is the worst for detecting any breast cancers, really. So really, using the triple test approach is, the, is really ideal. And again, if you get benign triplets, meaning benign radiology, benign clinical exam, benign cytology, Generally, the patients, if they have a lesion, are going to be followed clinically with a return visit within six months. If it's malignant, then everything malignant, it all fits together um, as malignant, then they refer the patient for either for definitive therapy, um, which can, which can uh, mean either a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, with or without frozen section confirmation at the time of the procedure. If anything is mixed or inconclusive, then that's when you would do an excisional biopsy to provide of the area to provide a more definitive pathology diagnosis. Okay, and here is the chart that's taken right from the handout that you got this morning. Um, or actually, is, this is taken from American Journal of Surgery in 2006, but there's a similar one in your handout on, towards the, uh, on page uh, 308. And again, it, it really tells you how to approach um, the follow-up of the patient with the FNA results. If it, and it depends whether it's a solid lesion or a cystic lesion. Now, with cystic lesion, oftentimes the mass will go away after you aspirate the cyst. And again, if the fluid is clear, you have the surgeon or whoever's doing the FNA has the option of discarding the specimen. If it's not, then you definitely want to um, uh, prepare the fluid cytologically. And of course, if it's benign, you know, routine follow-up, malignant, obviously definitive therapy, et cetera. Now, if there's a residual mass after the cyst fluid is aspirated, then a re-aspiration or excision is necessary. Now, if it's a solid nodule and it's been, you've got your benign triplet, as I mentioned, you follow clinically. Uh, if it's malignant, and you've got a malignant triplet, then again, a patient can be referred for definitive therapy. Anything in between, you know, inconclusive, then they, they need a tissue biopsy before definitive therapy or follow-up is determined. And that's it. Any questions? All right. Well, okay, so um, it's 11 o'clock now. Do you guys want to take a break for lunch before we do the workshop? Do you guys do lunch? No. <laughs> I, I was told yesterday you guys don't even do lunch. Okay. Or we can just take a 15-minute break and then get ready to look at some slides. What would you prefer? Except it doesn't matter to me. That's it? You want to just... Okay, so we'll take a... Let me take a 15-minute break first, though, and then we'll, we'll meet at the school. And we'll go for an hour for that, and then um, and then we have a little visual quiz after that. That little practice quiz, nothing graded, it's just to help you. Okay, all right. Can I get it? See that? Let me see it. Oh, yes. I just need to see it real quick. 
See, I just need to see a bit. I think here I have examples of anything. For those variants, those uh, ductal carcinoma variants, adenal carcinoma variants, you don't have to, like, if you don't put it down, you don't have to, like, you know, the reason it's there is, like, you can put all the people in there, but, uh, you know, the main thing is, if you get, you have to have a minimum ductal and 